Uh, okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to our Friday afternoon series at Manor Road. Our talk today will be on urban beekeeping with Tara. Uh, you know, cities and beekeeping, we don't usually think of them together, but she's gonna explain how this works. So Tara. Uh, perfect. So. Um... I'm Tara, I'm a beekeeper uh, currently located in Muskoka, Ontario, but uh, I also work uh, part-time with Bee Local 416, which is situated in several neighborhoods around Toronto, actually. Um, and so uh, if you want actually to share screen there, I can pull up the slides um, and I can go through a quick little presentation. Um, if you wanna share my screen, I can make that um, available for you guys now. Yep, uh, your co-host, so you can go ahead. Oh, okay, perfect. So I can just press the share screen. Yep. Okay, perfect. Let me just, uh, sorry, go ahead and share my screen and then I'll just pull up this presentation here. Sorry for my tech skills being not quite as savvy and smooth, but I'm getting there. So can you see the screen now where it says um, yes. of the Honeybee presentation? Yep. Okay, perfect. So Be Local 416, um, we basically, um, in this presentation, we normally would cover our story, um, a little bit about honeybee biology, what sustainable beekeeping is, or IPM, uh, which is a short form for integrated pest management. So this might be of interest, or you might have heard of this terminology before if you're a beekeeper or if you do any kind of lawn management. Uh, we also talk about um, some of our high products that are available to be purchased um, in different locations in Toronto, so pollen, honey, and we talk a little bit in this presentation about um, forage, so what bees eat and what they what their diet consists of. So a little bit about our story, uh, Bee Local 416 and why we keep bees in Toronto. Um, because the future depends on sustainable agriculture, um, as many of us now know and are more aware more than ever with um, COVID and related supply chain issues, um, our food chain is fragile. It's become uh, a big uh, business agriculture and there's been a movement, you know, more grassroots in the last five to 10 years of, you know, eating local, supporting local, but that movement I think is definitely picking up steam. And so Be Local was founded on those principles of, um, you know, wanting to do sustainable agriculture uh, within the city. Yeah, Joseph lives himself, the founder within the city and takes care of bees within uh, rooftops, different backyards. Um, so they're cared for by different registered beekeepers, including myself, sometimes volunteer uh, bee students. Um, yeah, a team of people look care, take care of our bees. And our philosophy is, you know, based on sort of an old environmental adage of think globally, but act locally. So even within urban centers, uh, people have opportunities to, to do something for bees. So one of the locations for, um, uh, or one of the locations, this is actually a view from one of the locations of one of the, um, the rooftop honeybee hives. So bees are kept, uh, they don't need a lot of space. They do need a lot of sunshine, just like a lot of plants. They're very sun loving, so they need warmth, they need protection from like cold winds, um, and they really need access to water and, you know, just away from different hazards like, you know, ice or things like that or falling trees would be good. So urban environments are actually, oops, sorry, quite, quite good for, um, for bees to live in. So the next slide uh, in the section here, we can talk a little bit about honeybee biology. In this slide here, you can see different stages of bees. So that's a natural honeycomb. Uh, you have adult female bees making up the most of the majority of the bees and then underneath the open caps you can see those c-shaped larvae which are pupa or you know different stages of bees um, in some of the black sort of honeycombs you might see if you looked a little closer if we had better lighting um, small eggs um, so this is a typical brood what we call a brood frame in a honey beehive or where they would make babies so the nursery of the beehive um, and so we'll talk about how bees are actually made and this video kind of goes through it a little bit here. So I'm just going to play a short video here and hopefully you can enjoy this uh, introduction to bee biology. The honeybee is one of the most collaborative insects in the world. Each hive is comprised of thousands of bees working together in order to build and sustain a colony. Within the colony, each bee has a specific role to play, a job. If you These are jobs like foraging for food, tending to young larvae and building a honeycomb. But with a brain about the size of a sesame seed, it begs the question, how do bees know what specific job they need to do in order to keep balance in the hive? The answer is written into the genetic makeup of each bee. And it starts with the queen bee. 
has the unique ability to designate the sex of her children, which plays a pivotal role in their future. If the queen wants to lay a female egg, she will fertilize the egg by releasing spermatozoa that is stored in the spermatheca, which sits behind her ovaries. The spermatheca is filled during her first week of life, when she mates with up to 20 drones, or male beaks. If the queen wants to lay a male egg, she will not release any spermatozoa as the egg leaves the ovaries. And drones have a singular job. That job is to mate with queens from other colonies to propagate the species. When they're not trying to mate, they eat leisurely from the honey reserves and wait for a queen to go on her nuptial flight. Female bees, or worker bees, do literally everything else. They keep the cells clean, care for the larvae, build cells, tend to the queen, store honey, forage, pollinate, guard the nest, and even feed male bees honey if they're begging for it. Each bee knows what to do because their hormones activate the part of their genetic makeup that tells them what jobs they have to tackle and when they have to tackle them. They go through four phases of jobs before dying. In phase one, bees go to work immediately after they emerge from metamorphosis, about three weeks after they're born. They begin cleaning the cells from which they emerge. After about three days, their hormones shift them into nurse mode. In this job, they feed the young brood that succeeds them. This lasts for about a week. Then phase three kicks in, and the workers become general handymen, moving farther away from the center of the hive and doing things like building honeycomb, storing food, and guarding the nest entrances. This lasts about a week. The final phase is the most dangerous. It's the foraging phase, where workers leave the nest to find pollen to bring home and feed the colony. This phase starts around day 41 and lasts until about day 50. After a short life of constant work, most workers will leave the nest as death approaches. Corpses of those that die inside the hive are carried out by undertaker bees. It's a thankless life for the worker bee, but this collaboration and process has made them one of the most successful superorganisms in nature. So there you see a quick uh, video. There's more about that on National Geographic, but uh, it just gives you a quick overview about how bees are made and an introduction um, to the importance of how they work through their life cycle. Um, and as a beekeeper, knowing the life cycle of bees is very important because when we learn how to manipulate and check a hive, uh, the timing of when we can go back and in into a hive uh, is very important. Um, so we had a question here. Normally this chat was, or this presentation is, is geared towards a participative audience, but um, you know, if you had to guess, you know, how many people often actually as a beekeeper at markets in different places, people will say, how many honeybees do you have? And it's a really difficult question uh, to answer sometimes because it fluctuates. So basically um, within, um, within the, uh, the season, even uh, the, the, basically the, the, the season within summer, peak summer, there might be, you know, up to 80,000 bees in a hive, but then uh, in the spring, you know, when they're just coming through winter, there might only be just a, you know, 8,000. So they really have the ability to adjust their population based on the resources that are available and based on uh, the season as well. Uh, but it is quite surprising when you, it's like looking at a, a jelly bean jar, a jelly bean and trying to guess how many jelly beans are in a jar. Um, when you look at a beehive, it's really hard sometimes to guess how many bees are there. Sorry, I'm just gonna advance to the next slide. Oops, that went too far. So uh, again, that video uh, uh, explained that there's different um, drones, uh, different types of bees, sorry, like the drones are the male bees, the worker bees are the female bees that make up the majority of the hive. And then there's the one uh, special bee in the hive, which is a queen bee um, who is fed a special diet. Um, and she has the shortest lifespan because she's the most important uh, from a reproductive standpoint. Um, as you noted in the beehive, she's the one who decides whether to lay a fertilized egg or a non-fertilized egg. And so in the summer, she ramps up by laying uh, more fertilized eggs to increase the worker population to be at their peak when uh, all this stuff right now, like we have uh, in bloom, so that the force is full um, when they're collecting all the available resources when uh, all the gardens are in full bloom. So right now they're still growing in population uh, in spring. The queen's laying up to sometimes two to 8,000 um, eggs a day. So. Um, and the next video or here, I think it's a video, um, we'll show you a little bit about the queen honeybee. Um, and why she's important. Oh, sorry. That's not a video, sorry, that was just a photo. My, my apologies. 
And then here's a video or a, sorry, a photo of uh, worker bees. And you can kind of see in the middle there, there's the queen bee and this is the video here. Um, and then it talks a little bit more about the different um, casts or if you will, or different uh, bees that make up the beehive. Oh, we don't have the volume. Oh, sorry, there is no volume for this one. It was just to show you, try to have to find the queen bee. So there you see the queen bee is marked. She's a little bit larger than the worker bees. Her abdomen is longer, like it mentioned in the video. Um, and it's very important as a beekeeper to train our eyes to learn how to find a queen on a frame. Uh, and sometimes we mark them then with these painted markers um, representing the year in which a queen is born. So there's a bit of an acronym, will you raise good bees representing each color like red, uh, for will, uh, or sorry, white for red, will, red for the, uh, will you raise good bees? And then so that way we know uh, in the, it, you know, which year they're born in based on a chart that we keep as beekeepers. So it also makes them visually easier to, to, um, to find when we're in the hive. So uh, we mentioned talking about in sustainable beekeeping and why, why that's important because bees, as you know, or many of you might already know, um, are really at risk. Their populations have really rapidly declined from an environmental pr perspective over the last um, several decades. And so many beekeepers are focused on sort of natural beekeeping methods and bee collaborative as, as one, and so is Bee Local um, in Toronto. And we focus on using just um, uh, organic treatments and trying to find ways to treat bees that are less um, chemically harsh. Um, they are already sus sort of assaulted by herbicides and pesticides and have had to adapt to really harmful uh, environments. And so we really wanna keep um, those things um, free and out of the hive as much as possible. But unfortunately, bees are inundated with pests and diseases, um, including the Varroa mite, which is a very, it's almost like a big large tick that bees attach to, to bees and spread diseases and make them very sick um, and really can devastate bee populations and beekeeping operations. And so, uh, it's really important to manage in this picture here, you see us managing how to monitor the mites and how to count how many there is, maybe or estimate how many there might be. Um, you know, bees that are healthy can sustain a certain load, just like a healthy dog can maybe, you know, take one tick bite. But if he had 20 ticks on him and he didn't do anything, well, your dog is obviously going to suffer. And so bees are very similar, they're livestock and we treat them similar to you would your dog and we want to give them the best treatment possible. So I'll just... Uh, Going to go forward a little bit more about that um, um, on how we why we chose that method of treating them and these are just some of the diseases that uh, you know bees are actually trying to fight off um, you know wax moth is one that uh, infests the actual honeycomb american foul brood is a very um, deadly bacterial disease that can survive you know very cold temperatures and can live on bee equipment that's 40 years old and so there's all kinds of things that you know bees are Beekeepers are almost scientists, but they're, you know, they're, they're, they're more as well because they're looking at, um, you know, diagnosing issues and they're almost like doing autopsies every spring. And so um, these are many of the diseases that, you know, over time, just bees have accumulated from having to, you know, environmentally adapt to different uh, environments, both moisture within the hive or, you know, bacteria that's just naturally found in the environment, et cetera. So um, these are different ways that we control pests. This might be familiar again to gardeners in your, in your group. Um, cultural controls, physical controls, chemical controls, they're all different methods that we use to try to um, you know, manage those pests and diseases that bees are assaulted with. Um, ideally, we wanna try to use best management practices that maximize bee health and minimize the risks of diseases spreading. Uh, so that's a large focus of uh, Bee Local's um, you know, objectives. Uh, and we also tried like an example of this is like, you know, um, using young queens, replacing the queens with um, healthy bred queens, using fresh equipment every year, like, you know, tracking that we're not using old equipment just to save money, but that we're, we're allowing um, the bees to have a good environment, just like you wouldn't allow your house to come into disrepair. You know, we have to maintain the, the hives that bees live in every year as well. So there's many aspects that we might not think of when we manage Bees, but the rewards of beekeeping are the products that we get from bees and the value of them. So some of the things that we collect from bees that are valuable to us and that, you know, you know, have very many health benefits and whatnot, uh, as bee pollen is one of them, three out of four crops across the globe uh, that are produced fruits or seeds for human use need pollination and need pollen. And bees basically take pollen from plants because plants don't have legs and wings. So plants take the um, you know, pollen from plants and transfer them over so that we can enjoy things like watermelon out of season or 
fruits and vegetables that we get at the grocery store. So if we didn't have bees, um, the aisle at the grocery store would definitely look different. So just a quick review on why pollination is important. Um, you know, they collect, I mean, I think this is a lesson we all learn maybe in public school, but we can, we can all do with reviewing it. I know when I was an adult and became a beekeeper, I was fascinated again with how amazing plants are, but, um, you know, bees are really an integral part with, you know, obviously some plants are wind pollinated and don't need bees, bees to propagate. Um, but when we, when we, um, understand how many crops are dependent on bees pollinating them and the, the knock-on effect that if bees disappear from the environment, um, you know, like there's places now in China where they have to hand pollinate a lot of plants because the environment is so thick with, you know, uh, you know, pollution and stuff. So, you know, overpopulation and the habitat loss is a real problem everywhere. This is the result of what you would see um, in spring with a disease um, that we, we talk about um, called nosema and it gives bees the runs, unfortunately. So here you can see sort of fecal matter that looks like sort of yellow drippings all on the front of the, the winter cover. And then you can also see pollen um, and they're bringing in fresh pollen on the legs. You, if you look a little bit closer, um, there's bees bringing in fresh pollen that we collect um, through a very clean method. Not, you know, this, this is the pollen that they use in the spring, but in the, in the summer, as things go on, we collect pollen that you can then uh, use for your own health purposes. But here's a short video as well explaining or showing just bees bringing in pollen in the spring and how how much they need it to bring in um, to make to raise babies so you can see how many worker bees are focused by all the yellow legs coming in on just bringing in as much pollen as possible so pollen and pollen producing plants in the spring are very important ways you can support bees um, planting native plants and shrubs uh, native trees that flower and again you might not realize um, but within uh, i'm going to just skip past what honey is because i think you guys probably know what honey is um, but it is, there's a definition of it there that you could read through. Um, it's gathered from honeydew and nectar, and then bees actually process it. There's a chemical process that they do, taking the moisture from all the nectar and then fanning it down um, with both their body heat and fanning their wings um, to a certain moisture content and then capping it off so that it doesn't spoil or go bad. So fermented honey, you know, you know, creates meat or alcohol, but bees would then get sick on, on that. So they store honey at a specific temperature, just like we would store food in a pantry that makes it keep over winter. And so it's quite fascinating how they've done a, got it down to a science. So here you see a beekeeper in a field uh, working, working colonies. Um, I believe that's Ontario Beekeeping um, Association, Paul Kelly video here that I can play for you. And it'll just talk a little bit um, about more of the product of honey. So we talked about pollen, but this shares a little bit more about honey. Honey is oh so sweet, but if sugars are added and not declared on the label, that is a form of food fraud. Canadians love their honey. In 2019, Canada produced 80 million pounds of honey worth $173 million and we imported another $45 million worth of honey. As part of our work to test food for authenticity, the CFIA tests honey samples for added sugars. Testing done in 2019 and 2020 showed 93% of samples tested were authentic. The rest of the samples tested had added sugars that didn't meet regulatory requirements. From these latest efforts, we prevented more than 83,000 kilograms of adulterated honey from being sold in Canada. So at CFIA, we have two different types of sampling. Monitoring sampling, which is random. It's used to establish baseline data and to identify areas of risk. And then we have targeted sampling, and that's generally based on a history of non-compliance, on gaps in preventative controls, and unusual trading patterns. So in general, CFIA will test honey for added sugars, but also residues and contaminants, and also test to make sure that it complies with the regulations and standards. For this targeted survey, we focused on authenticity. Only pure honey can be labeled and sold as honey in Canada. When we do find honey that is not authentic, we have the authority to respond in a number of different ways. We could seize, detain, or remove the product from Canada, or it could be thrown out. We can also work with our partners at the Canadian Border Services Agency to put in place what we call a border lookout for non-compliant products. In addition, the CFIA could recommend prosecution of companies that sell or import adulterated food products, or we could revoke import licenses. 
CFIA carries out inspection, compliance, and enforcement activities to protect consumers from deceptive practices and to maintain a fair marketplace for industry. But consumers also have a role to play. Check labels to see if information may be misleading and contact companies directly to ask questions. Whether you purchase your honey in store or online, we all have a role to play. Visit our website to learn more and check out the latest report on our honey testing at inspection.gc.ca slash food fraud. So that's another reason why, unfortunately, honey prices have gone up and why it's difficult for beekeepers to um, to to make a living, honestly, because uh, they can't compete with a lot of the larger um, big box type of operations that are then uh, diluting honey. There's a really good uh, program. I think it's, uh, I can't remember the name of the documentary anyway. I think it's on Netflix that talks about more about honey food fraud, but ways you can support uh, then um, beekeepers and, 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 and bees is to make sure that you're supporting a known beekeeper. So someone locally, um, someone who knows that you know where your product comes from. So, and then reading the labels, as the video said, is important as well. So if you see in the grocery store honeys, um, that are not from this country or from the province, uh, there's a likelihood that it might've been blended with other honeys. And then, you know, we don't know the standards of, of, of that honey quality, whether it's been mixed with maybe cane sugar or beet sugars or other things just to kind of make it more profitable. So at Bee Collaborative, I can assure you it's all real authentic honey collected within the boundaries of the Toronto uh, area within the neighborhoods that the hives were placed because bees can only forage, and this is, brings us to our next section, uh, from, from where they're placed about five to eight kilometers. So within five to eight kilometers, circular radius of that hive is as far out as they can fly to get whatever they need from, from their diet. So uh, when bees, where they find bees and what they sort of forage on in Toronto, um, this is just basically a lot of the uh, plants that you may just walk by every day and not know of, or you might know very well if you're a gardener. Um, but uh, you can find them in ditches, in ravines, just in natural places, in parks as well. Um, but uh, in the top there, there, you have lots of asters, which are very um, popular um, flowers for bees to visit and different pollinators to visit. Uh, goldenrod is, a, very, is a, nat a native plant of Ontario that is a very good resource in the fall for bees. Uh, and they collect quite a bit of pollen uh, that gets them, I think, through the winters as well. Uh, willow is a good source of spring pollen. Uh, staghorn sumac, which you'll see all the time in, on highways, often you'll see those big red sort of looks like almost like antlers and then they're fuzzy. Uh, sumac is uh, another prolific source of um, both pollen and nectar actually uh, when it flowers for bees and different pollinators. Uh, not pictured in this set here is, is milkweed, which you would have heard of as well as a host plant for monarchs. It's a very important plant. Here in Muskoka, it's very prolific, but we are seeing a lot of habitat loss, you know, as we cut down parking lots and make, uh, you know, more condos available. Um, so if you see milkweed in ditches and ravines in Toronto, cherish it and grab those seeds. Um, it's definitely good stuff for, for lots of different pollinators. Uh, sweet clover, which is on lawns and maybe people try to get rid of is also a good source of nectar for lots of different bees and pollinators. Um, other different things that people think of as weeds like Dandelions uh, are also great sources of pollen and nectar. Uh, Joe pie weed, blue weed, thistle, um, all great different uh, resources for different pollinators. Um, and, and these are all pictures that, uh, you know, these list this is not exhaustive. You can, there's non-native plants and native plants. Bees are not fussy. They'll, you know, enjoy a good buffet, but um, they're generalist pollinators. So they'll go wherever the food is. Um, peonies are one of my favorites. Um, just for the ant and the collaboration story, but um, also great um, resource for nectar once the summer gets going. And then another place that you might not think of that bees visit and you may see them in their garden um, and they could be a bee local bee that collects your honey that's available in the grocery store are residential property. So right in people's own backyards. So many of the hives that bee local 416 keep are actually in residential backyards. Some are on, you know, rooftops, but some are also just in more um, residential neighborhoods where there's really old growth trees and, uh, you know, different uh, like sunflowers. Bees love sunflowers. But one thing that we don't often think of um, within the urban center is the urban tree canopy it is such a great resource, and especially in the city where, um, you know, you have such old ancient trees like, you know, 
like basswood is a great tasting honey. It has kind of a minty distinctive flavor, but you know, even our distinctive red maple in the early spring, it's a great resource of nectar for pollinators. So many things right now up here uh, north of the city are in, might already be out of bloom now in the city, but crab apples and apples, hawthorns all in bloom right now. Uh, black locust is another great tree resource. So if you're thinking about, you know, trees to plant or how can I plant things on my property that would benefit, benefit pollinators, these are all great suggestions of um, things. Or you can just go into your local landscape or garden center and ask about pollinator friendly plants. But just also make sure that they're not treated with anything or seed treated beforehand, um, that they um, are neonicotinoid free. So that's a thing to be aware of as well. So again, more, more trees that are available that bees dine on in the city, cherry and horse chestnut is one of my favorite just because of the beautiful pollen that they bring in from it is like a bright pink or red color. Um, and so it's fun when we collect the pollen when we see the horse chestnut uh, pollen coming in. So that's just some resources. If you wanted to learn more about bees, you could take a screenshot of those things, um, you know, where the sort of videos come from. There's lots more resources online. Um, Joseph's often um, doing things, um, you know, activities at, I think it's Cusa Terry's where he might do tastings and you can ask local beekeepers questions at, at your local markets. Uh, if, you, if you're curious, then they're usually happy to answer any of your questions about bees. Um, but that's hopefully some, some little sort of introduction to where um, bees really thrive uh, in the city and how you can help them. And that's um, Be Local 416, a little bit about why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. Very <clears throat> interesting. I find it, you know, uh, you were talking about milkweed, which for a long time seemed to be almost extinct. And so many of these other plants, uh, I, like I had sumacs taking over my backyard, people see right. these, you know, uh, as unwanted. And yet it's part of the ecosystem. And so the information getting out there that, hey, look, we need these. So, yeah, and well, and I mean, it's all about perspective, obviously, you know, depending on where you're coming from, this whole idea of even invasive versus non-invasive and uh, native versus non-native plants. I mean, bees are non-native to North America, but then we've brought in so many non-native plants so that, you know, there is a symbiosis that eventually happens. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's an aware, it starts with an awareness of even just the plants that surround you in your own neighborhood and, and looking for the things that are on them, like finding the bees and where they're visiting and in your own garden and seeing, you know, why they, you know, what they might be visiting it for. Um, because they definitely all have, all the plants have benefits um, for the bees and, and different pollinators as well. That's good. The other thing I'm noticing is that lawns are falling out of favor and that's usually the, the chief source of clover. So that's right. Might come in. Yeah, there is a trend actually growing of clover lawns, um, even as people are, you know, doing backyard beekeeping and backyard chickens and backyard kind of homesteading. Um, yeah, letting wild grow, lawns grow wild and, and even different municipalities are doing things like no mow may to help the dandelions kind of be out there for pollinators and re kind of recasting the poor dandelion weed uh, into more favorable light has been a, has been definitely an objective of beekeepers for a while now so. Mm -hmm. Are you in, um, is there a partnership with schools um, that you are yeah. taking or currently have right now? Be Local definitely does work with school boards and does educational talks. We just did one recently for Earth Day, um, kind of Earth themed week in April. We were speaking to Catholic School Board, I believe it was. Um, so yeah, you can contact again. I can put up that slide, but Joseph, um, our info at, <coughs> sorry, Be Local 416, if you wanted any more information about how to connect yeah, for sure. educational programs in schools, for sure. Yeah. 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 Sorry, all the talking now has me have a, a little frog in my throat. Oh, that's, that's okay. okay. <laughs> Get yourself some water. I will. Yeah, yeah. hydrate yourself. Uh, yes, yeah. there's any ways that you can help. I mean, there's there's ways that you can sponsor hives through Be Local, but you can also just support by buying, you know, Be Local honey. Mm -hmm. There's also tasting events that uh, Joseph does, which I found really fascinating because even he does, he, one of the things that's really unique about Be Local is they collect uh, the honey and separate it by neighborhood. So depending on, what neighborhood the honey is collected from. It has a very unique flavor, color, and taste profile. Um, mm. and so, you know, and again, it goes down to where those bees live and what they collect in their neighborhood. So they naturally represent the neighborhood in which they live. So it can't get more local than be local honey, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was somebody uh, who used to come to the 
apple tree market at Jean Rowlands Park here in the neighborhood on Tuesdays. I haven't seen them yet. I'm hoping they'll come back. But yes, they had all kinds of bee products. I tried the bee pollen and I found that quite, quite good. I like um, the way it tastes. I think it tastes like gelato, but it's not everybody's mm -hmm. bee. Well, it, it's fun to sprinkle on stuff, you know, mm -hmm. salad. Makes it colorful. Um, so, so people can go to your website and then uh, find out what's involved in sponsoring a hive. Correct. So, yeah. So be local for one six dot ca. Um, and then, yeah, I'll just I could put up the screen again. But uh, if you just Google be local for one six, you'll find out more information. There's more videos. Um, you, if you were interested in contacting them to have, you know, for a, a school or something, another project, you can definitely follow up with him. Okay. That, that's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. There's lots of things going on in the city that we don't even see. I know the there's right under uh, our noses. Of, one of our people is is involved in a um, so many local fruit trees are not grown for fruit. They were just always there, and then the mm. crab apples fall off, and then so he's been involved in uh, harvesting those with the oh, owners. Nice. Forest. So yeah, there's a lot of and and then there's um, blackberry <coughs> bushes and and all sorts of things around so well thank a pollinator for all that fruit then all the free fruit around the city <laughs> i will so thank you very much you're welcome um, it was my pleasure i hope you found it interesting i did very interesting yeah and great. hope uh, thank you everyone for coming i hope you can join us next week we have michael johnson who will be talking about the canadian peacekeeping forces that were founded in 1956 and what they've had to deal with and encounter being soldiers who aren't quite soldiers so that i hope you can join us then all right thank you tara thank you Suzanne. you're welcome bye right. now have a good weekend bye 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 all right see you